Thanks to Sherry and Elise for putting up with my shit all week. Uh, it's been a <laughs> it's been a rough week with the holiday in between and it everything. It took a long time, but at the last minute, everything got up perfectly because they're pros here um, and awesome. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what this is. So this is the first time that this piece, which is called a Monkey Mountain Chronicle, has been shown outside of art fairs. This is the first um, gallery presentation of it. And it's called a Monkey Mountain Chronicle, and the basic idea behind it started in probably 2015, and I typically plan my projects over a long period of time before I get to them. So I started this in 2017. So I worked about a year and a half on all the planning, a lot of preparatory drawing while I was finishing the big project before this, which was called Electric Baloney Land. And a lot of my work over the last 29 years, which you can see in the book, um, there's the plug. Um, ha it started with hillbillies doing bad stuff, okay? Because that's where I grew up. I grew up in a really small town in southern Missouri called Potosi, and I think there's like 1,200 people live there then. There's probably 2,000 that live there now. And I made fun of my immediate surroundings, and I was really, and still am, influenced by old printmakers, artists like Durer, Hogarth, Daumier, Goya, Katie Kolowitz, and uh, Posada. That's my main, those are my like top five or six. And all of those artists worked in suites of unified bodies of work that said one thing while telling individual stories that resolved themselves as a whole, as a body of work, like Dewar's Apocalypse. And when I was 12 years old, I saw twice in one summer the work of Albrecht Dewar. Um, when, oh, 84, 1984, my grandparents took me on a trip to Europe, and I went to the, we went to the Sistine Chapel when I was 12. And leading into the Sistine Chapel, what is a gallery where they put up other work and while you're, and you're waiting in line to go through the chapel in that gallery so while the line was moving on either side of me was Dewar's apocalypse all the woodcuts and the thing about that is the vatican didn't buy those prints in the 80s they bought those prints from him okay which is pretty amazing and so I saw that going into the Sistine Chapel. That's a big day. I didn't know who Dewar was. I didn't know what a woodcut was, but I thought they were, I thought they were just drawings. Then, but it stuck with me. I didn't really remember his name. And then I came home a couple of weeks later. And then like a month later, my parents took us on a trip through state parks all the way out to Washington, D.C. We got to D.C., um, and it's like, it's just like National Lampoon's vacation with my family. It's like, I'm the oldest of five kids. There's a trailer behind a station wagon. You, mid-80s, mid you can figure it out. And um, we got to D.C., and Tommy's an artist, so they, my parents were, and still are, very supportive of what I do. So we're going to go to the National Gallery of Art for a day. Go to the National Gallery of Art, and there was, I, it's changed now, but there was a, a area specifically for prints and drawings. And so, what was up? Dewar's Apocalypse. So I saw it twice at 12 years old, and my mom gave me $20 to buy a book in the bookstore, and I bought the complete woodcuts of Albrecht Dewar. Still not really knowing what a woodcut was, and that was it. And I just thought they were really cool drawings. And the thing about those prints is that I was 12, almost 13, a total 
heavy metal kid where I like bands like Motorhead and Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and all the album art has a look to it. You know, they're medieval themes with a lot of heavy metal music. And Albert Durer, any one of those images could have been an album cover for Iron Maiden. I mean, it's that kind of dark and lurid medieval subject matter. Humorous, there's some humor in there. And so that's my biggest influence. I just, like I said, I thought they were drawings. And so then you flash forward many, 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 many years later, and here I am now doing work that's like in that vein. And so I've moved, still having Durer as the benchmark, I've moved away from doing like typical narratives of, you know, hillbillies doing bad stuff in crazy southern Missouri. I use a lot more allegory and metaphor now in my work, and it's a broader based social commentary. There's still hillbillies doing bad stuff in there because we're, you know, hillbillies tried to take over the damn government not that long ago, so it's not going away. The guilty party's just ha it has expanded in my my visual language, and I always in all of my work, and I've said this a lot in all the interviews I've given, in the talks that I've given, and I can't be more serious or get across to you how serious this is to me. But every single day that I am in the studio, when I wake up in the morning and I'm having my coffee and I'm about to go into the studio, I contemplate having to make prints that were as good as Dewar and my heroes. Those artists are my lineage and I look at those artists as members of my family. In the like you go to the graveyard and you're visiting your relatives, that's what it's like going to museums for me and print and drawing study rooms. And I'm getting to visit um, my family when I see that stuff. So I want to be part of print history. So over the years, when you have that kind of a drive and you have that kind of an approach to your studio practice, where there's a lot of self-imposed art historical pressure, I'm always, by default, I am always trying to do something bigger, better, crazier, different. Because I have a lot of friends that are amazing printmakers. And over, I don't want to say it, I'm not calling anybody out. It's a general impression of just a lot of people that make Prince especially, um, my closest friends don't, but I don't want to make the same print for the rest of my life. What's the point of that? One of my friends was like, what? I was explaining when I was coming up with this project, he was like, what are you going to do next, Huck? And I was like, oh, I'm going to do this altarpiece on paper that you can walk around and it opens and closes, but it's really going to live in print rooms and all and and you know we got to glue it together and it's going to sort of line up hopefully and all that and he was like why does everything have to be so hard and difficult and i was like i don't want to make the same print for the rest of my life you know so a monkey mountain chronicle this print here was born out of the project before it as that project was, and on and on and on. And it's always a reference to print history and art history in all of my work. I'm always noting uh, my artistic forefathers and mothers. And this one in particular, it's more of a, a, a nod to image-wise um, Dewar, of course, but concept-wise, it's more of a nod to the painters of the North. Artists like Van Eck and Bruegel, Van der Weyden, Gerhard David, all the Flemish masters who did these amazing altarpieces, which I've always loved. I mean, what's, 
I mean, you've got the heaven. Heaven's always boring. The hell is where I like to look around. You know, all the cool stuff's going on in, in hell. It looks like they're having a lot more fun. And so you've got the heaven and the hell thing as an influence always in the work. But I wanted to think about, okay, the realization was through the planning is that I'm, I'm not really making these prints uh, for individuals to have anymore. I'm kind of making them for museums. That's what has, is a weird realization because you're gonna, somebody will, but you're going to put this in your house? I mean, it's just the concept ends up being, oh, it needs to go to where the public can see it. And it's also um, doing an altarpiece on paper, which is what I came up with, is a way of when you go to a print and drawing study room, it's paying reverence to it. It's a devotional object. And so religion became a theme. If you're doing a, an altarpiece, it's a religious thing. So that was there by default as it being a, a, a relic <laughs> that you would see. And also the secondary great bonus is that when these things end up in print and drawing study rooms and museum collections, I kind of want to be a big pain in the ass a hundred years from now, it's like, I want to see the Tom Huck. And they'll be like, oh my God, we got to pull out the Tom Huck, a Monkey Mountain Chronicle. It's not going to be forgotten. <laughs> because as far as I know, there's never been an altarpiece on paper before. As far as I know. The print before this, I know for a fact it's the biggest chiaroscuro woodcut that's ever been done. So it's like, I'm trying to keep want to make art history, want to make printmaking history. So, to the actual subject matter, there's the background, as best as I can recall and, and uh, explain it, what went into the planning and the references. So, obviously, I, we're living in a time that's quite difficult, but all times have been difficult. And politically, it's a mess. People are a mess. People have lost their minds. But I think they've always lost their minds. And I, I'm concerned about it. <laughs> and when I'm doing a project, this is my way of working it out for myself. And I do a lot of research before... Like the next big thing is going to be about war. So I'm like studying World War II bomber planes. You know, I, I put a lot of time into the research before I get up to these things. And the whole idea behind a Monkey Mountain Chronicle, it's American gluttony. Because there's so much crap going on that overlaps. It overwhelms us as citizens of this country, and I decided American gluttony is kind of where we're at, where it's gluttony of religion, it's gluttony of politics, it's gluttony of conspiracy theories, and bad food. And the bad food became the trigger in here. I call them, when I taught, I used to tell my students they're called visual hooks, where there are things that are in there that are parody or that you can hook onto as a viewer and see that there's something that draws you in on a different narrative level that means something very complex but simple at the same time. I know that's really vague and all over the place. but So the idea became food as the theme and where I got that in thinking about all this and drawing about all this because I work every day in my sketchbook on stuff it, the idea is that we're being sold hate with a nice, sweet logo. It's marketed to us in a not-so-blatant way. It's like you put a, on a hat that says, Make America Great Again, you give it a logo. 
they're making it sugary sweet for their followers, okay? And it's easier to digest, and it's sort of underhanded to get people to go along with it. And they, don't, they never come right out and say that, you know, it's about racism, and it's, you know, we're better, or there's white supremacy involved. So that was the idea. And also, I, my, my conspiracy theory in all this is the more crap people eat, the worse people they become. Maybe that has something to do with it because every sugar is in everything. And of course, the easy target is McDonald's. And the reason I sort of went after McDonald's in this is because they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And it's so ingrained in our daily, we see it every day. You see it every day. You drive by one, there's a chance. Even in the middle of nowhere, there's a McDonald's someplace. And I figured out, well, if I'm going to make this about gluttony, what's, a, what's the animal that's associated with gluttony? Pigs. Pigging out. Okay. I figured out that as a symbol that isn't just using the McDonald's symbol, that if you take the McDonald's arch and you attach one on top of the other, it makes a pig snout. <laughs> So, on the priest's vestments up there, the common theme throughout, you'll see it from time to time, is the, the golden arches end over end attached, and it makes a pig snout. So, there, that's a visual hook that I'm talking about. So, I came up with this idea, I'm just going to throw everything in there all about gluttony that I can, and just make it this fantastical thing about gorging ourselves on all the stuff that I just said. So, the first scene, I did these in order, basically. The first scene that I had planned was the center panel. And it's called the Feast of Lord Apocalyptus. And basically, it's Lord Apocalyptus, the god of gluttony. <laughs> That's a pig skull. Um, he's a pig sending his angels of fast food death onto a food court and force feeding them chicken legs, Big Macs, hot dogs, tacos, everything, and just force feeding these people. And you can see, they're just, <laughs> it's just the worst case scenario. And then all you can eat is he's holding the, you know, the like little 4th of July or happy birthday streamer things that's in there. And on the front, which is the recto side, are these papal pigs at the top. Because when are we going to get better? When pigs fly. Okay? So that's what those are in there for. Now on the back side, which you should all walk around and look at after we're done, it's the, the skeletal versions of those same pigs that line up exactly on the back. So... So, in a weird way, this is, this is part heaven and hell in one piece. And it was a good image to build the narrative, the allegory, and the metaphor around. Because it sets it as a fantastic scene. 20 years ago, I wouldn't have done something like this. It would have been like, oh, there's a woman at a grease pig contest dressed in a prom dress, you know, competing against kids. That's pretty much enough, and I put that in my imagery, and there's an image about that. It's called Mark and the Grease Pig. I've kind of moved on from that, and I've, it's, it's makes more sense in an absolutely insanely absurd world. You might as well get absurd and insane in the imagery that depicts it, right? So that's sort of where I've gone. So the center panel, now on the... Left-hand side, I had to remind myself which is the left. On the left-hand side is, this is called the Great American Slice Centennial. And it's a George Washington three-layer cake that the, this wholesome, kind of, wholesome family is eating. And what that is basically about is Americans are devouring themselves. And they don't even realize it. And what they see as you know, American history. If you see in here, it says there's a one 
part of a 7 and a 76. When I was 5 years old, it was I was born in 71. When I was 5 years old, the big uh, bicentennial. It was everywhere. It was on beer cans. It was everywhere. It, every, and I remember that as a kid. And it was an early realization that they're putting it's on a beer can, you know? <laughs> it's like consumer driven. We don't take it that seriously how amazing it is that we exist. So but we're eating ourselves, and that's what it's about. So and they're slicing him up. And on top of it too, like these are our cats. This is this is Dave, and that's Bubba. His real name is Dave Growl, Dave Grohl, but its name's Dave Grohl. And I put halos behind them because they're the only true innocents in this whole shit show that is America. <laughs> it's the right response. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, if you look, there's all kinds of things in here, and there are also references to pet prints that I've done in the past. Um, this is a Chinese throwing star. And if you look up Electric Baloney Land, the big project before this, it was throwing, the Chinese throwing star was a constant theme through it because you can get, um, whose phone's going up? It's okay. It, it, the Chinese throwing star is, uh, is a constant theme. You got to look it up. It's, it's in the book. I didn't mean that as a plug, but like, it's actually in the book. But I'll bring that stuff back because sometimes it'll, it'll fit in a foreground needed. And also these beer cans have a T on them. That's Tenant's Beer. I did part of this project in Scotland with a print shop in Scotland. And that's what, that's their Budweiser is Tenant's. So there are little things like that. And the right inner panel is called Big Ot's Burger Barn. Now, if you get it, big it, but it's big odds, okay? And this is a direct thing about what I was talking about, like where the racism and bigotry is served to us on a daily basis, steeped in sweet, good-looking things, you know? And that's what that's about, uh, for the most part. I do remember when I see this, because I haven't talked about this like this ever. I haven't looked at this in a while, because um, I'm already, I'm on. I'm on the next thing. I'm over this. <laughs> Five years, I'm over it. The hardest thing to carve in this whole freaking thing, because I draw these things out first in pen and ink on the box, and then I carve it out, was this cheeseburger with hot dogs. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to carve that? And I just drew it the way it was. And so that is that. And also you'll see 100% pure, 100% pure beef. You know, that was the tagline. Well, that's the white supremacist way. It's got to be 100% pure. And see, I made that link to serving it to us. And her name is Pure Beef Patty. <laughs> there are also little things. She's got a button on her clan, half clan hat that says Pure Beef Patty. Sometimes those things come to me while I'm drawing these things. That wasn't in the sketch, but I'll put them in there when I'm doing the basic pencil drawing on the block. There's also a reference to, it says God hates you here on this guy's sign. That's a total reference to the Westboro the Westboro Church that does it is that the, that's a direct reference to them. Um, the best description of these things. So this one, I sold this one to the Met in April of last year. They got number one, and then they put it on their website and they wrote a description of it before, like I like a, an amazing curatorial description of this. <laughs> I suggest you go to the website. Type in Tom Huck and a Monkey Mountain Chronicle. It'll come up on the Met website. No pictures yet. But her description of this, it, I read it. I was like, it sounds like an absolute maniac did this. Because <laughs> she describes everything that is going on. And I, I, do, I do remember I looked at every place that I could to put in the 100% pure on this one. 
And she and her came off of the American Graffiti album cover. Do you remember this? And it's like, you know, the I, I get these things from all kinds of crazy sources. A lot of stuff comes from my childhood where I will reference things like that because I paid attention to that thing. I'm a highly visual person, and I remember that stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that in here. Uh, little details like, like chicken nuggets, but I just, instead of the nuggets, they're just chicken heads in this guy's pouch here. And I'm also like, Themes. I'm, I, I never, I'm always suspicious of theme campaigns for restaurants. It always gave me, me the creeps like the Chalupa Dog from Taco Bell years ago. Or Where's the Beef? I remember that from when I was a kid. That stuff sticks with me and I, I hate that stuff. I hate the marketing of fast food and the way they do it. So the king, you know, the Burger King hat. And this here, this... There are characters in this big, overlying, crazy drama that have names that aren't anywhere in the titling, but we, I nicknamed them. This is Mr. Swirly Licks. And Licks is an actual ice cream place like five minutes from my house. But it's just called Licks. Well, I'm going to make it, you know, Bones and Skulls. And Mr. Swirly Licks is like a... I like the cheesy promo stuff, though, that they use that tends to look a little retro. Like the, the mascots for old school ice cream stands. And I made the, the three here eating soft serve, you know, and you got to really look at it. There's a lot of little details. So this is Mr. Swirly Licks, and this guy is based on the Hardee's star guy. And he didn't have a name while I was I was in Scotland carving this. And David, my my host, I can't do the Scottish accent, but he was like, Who's that? And I go, oh, he doesn't have a name yet. And he's like, huh. And like the next day, I was freezing to death over there. I was completely unprepared. It's wet. I'm in Aberdeen. It's wet, it's cold, it's October. I w I'm like had short sleeves. <laughs> I was totally unprepared my first time there. And I went to some store and got a like hoodie that zips like this and it looked nice, you know. And I wore it into the shop the next day and Dave was like, oh, that's a real Bobby Dazzler you've got on there. And I was like, what's a Bobby Dazzler? And he's like, I think that's the stars guy guy's name. So this is Bobby Dazzler is his name. We did a Bobby Dazzler t-shirt that will be out this summer or something. Okay, so that's the front side. The back side, I can't get the group in here behind, but you should look at it um, after we're done. The outer panels, when this, it opens and closes, and when it closes, it makes one scene, and it's the entryway, basically, and it's introducing uh, Papa Apocalypto, the fifth, and Sister Marge is the, 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 um, pig woman nun hula hooping with a giant glazed donut, chocolate glazed donut, in a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs. See, I'm explaining this, and I'm like, what is wrong with me? And, and it's the Brides of Lord Apocalyptus, which is a subcult of uh, Papa Apocalyptus's main following. And uh, maybe there's a whole body of work of that down, down the line, a sequel. A spinoff, as it were. And the cat bats, which factor into the back panel. And when you look at it, you'll see the uh, skeletal papal pigs flying. And you'll notice this edge here. It's an irregular edge. And I had done a cutout print called The Transformation of Brandy Baghead a long time ago now. That was the first big triptych that I ever did. And this sort of recalls that, but this was not planned at all. It was originally when it closed, it was going to be straight edges, and one barely overlapped the other. And it was, oddly enough, it was Thanksgiving two years ago. I was 
at the very end of carving for this project. And it was probably 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And I was feeling good. Thanksgiving dinner awaits me. It was great. I was getting near the end of this project. And I'm sitting there about ready to pack everything up and go up to the house. And I got to looking at the, uh, the center panel, which was hanging up. I was looking at my blocks, and I was like, oh my God, I made the blocks too big. And because of COVID, I originally was going to do all of this in Scotland, but we, during COVID, we had to shift it, so I'm going to be doing most of it here, the finishing. And I was like, what's the size of the center panel? And they sent it over to me in metric. I did it in inches, and so I was this far off bigger on the outside panels. And I was like, ah! you know, it was terrible. And I called up a friend of mine like that night on Thanksgiving, a guy named Josh Rowan, who's this badass graphic designer. And I told him what is going on. He was like, I'll be down. At like 1 o'clock in the morning, he drove out to my place. This is one of those things that everybody's been through. And he, he an emergency situation. And Josh and I are looking at it, and he was like, man, this is bad. I go, yeah, man, this is really bad. What are we going to do? He was like, well, man, what it, how do we make up this amount of di difference when it's closed? And so he was like, well... He took a digital, he took a photo of it, and he went in digitally right there on his laptop, and he cut off the area, the distance that I needed to trim when it was, after it was printed, because I'm not going to change the blocks. And he made it so that he went along the edge of the bat, right around the title thing, and he goes, if you cut this out by hand, when the left side lays down, the right side will lay over it, and it should line up to make, to make it work. And I was like, okay, that's what I'll do. Well, we're gluing these things together. The first one, number one is already going to the Met. We hadn't even glued them together yet. We didn't know how to glue anything together. I was completely, it's one of those... Things were, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, it's going to be amazing. No problem. And my assistant Shelby, for the first time, she went along after they were, the panels were glued together. We hadn't hinged them together yet. She cut along exactly where Josh said to. We put the hinges on the middle, and then it came time to close it. And she closed this one, and we closed that one. And it lined up perfect, but it made them one seam. So like when it laid down, the stars tucked behind the title image. It was like, it's like you don't see it. It's like, oh, it worked, you know. And it, there are things like that in a five-year project that you do not plan on that end up being better than, than what happens. So when you look at the back scene, it's called... Mr. Wiener McPickleheads, Cat Bats, and the Gooey Guardian Girls. Okay, Mr. Wiener McPicklehead is, <laughs> is Satan. Okay, and Satan, it, there's a heaven and there's a hell, and it's flat earth. And I took all the conspiracy theories and I put them into this one scene. Um, so, there are, and, and myths. The idea is that there's also this thing with religion where they're anti-science a lot of times, and so they justify the Adam and Eve were running around with the dinosaurs. We've all heard it. And I'm like, okay. And then there's, and then I combined it with people gorge themselves on that myth, and then I combined it with the myth of Thanksgiving, where the Indians and the Pilgrims, you know, dine together in that scene, all happily and everything. But what I did was I made, this is, when I taught, I called it making a visual and a narrative leap, 
which is something that you can't really teach people to do. They have to get at this after lots of practice and lots of thinking. Where So what I did was my visual and narrative leap that became a visual hook was I'll take the pilgrims and the Indians and I'll put Adam and Eve in there all dining on a dinosaur for the Thanksgiving feast. Right? So that's the top part, but I'll put them on flat earth where they're falling off the edge of the earth as they gorge themselves down into a, an abyss where the cat bats are flying around with, with pieces of pizza that are being digested by two snake worm women and which are guarding Mr. Wiener McPicklehead who is a, a giant... Um, face formed out of fast food, Big Mac, pickles, french fries, onion rings, and, uh, and hot dogs, a la Archimboldo. Do we know who Archimboldo is? Go look up Archimboldo. 1500s Italian painter who did portraits of people, typically from the side, because that's the way that early Renaissance portraits were, out of fruit and vegetables. He made like people's faces out of fruit and vegetables. So I did that with fast food. And then I put that as the head on top of a giant flurry. You know, blizzard flurry from DQ. This like uh, Oreo cookies and, and ch a cherry on top and all that stuff. And, and there are people falling in, coming out of the giant flurry thing. And he's eating two people. I'm remembering this, not looking at it. So he's eating up two people. His arms are hot dog sausage arms and his, he's holding in chopsticks to a man and a woman that have a bucket and there's a they have a bucket <laughs> number one and number two. People are like, what's that mean? I go, it's pee and poop. Okay, it's really like that's not going to be in there. And then but I'm not, I will only say that to you. I'm not going to be like, oh, this is what it is written anywhere. I want people to kind of figure that stuff out because I like Bosch. And I like Bruegel. I want people to come back to these things and always find something new. Okay, so that's the back panel, the back center panel. And then the lower is actually called the lower uh, in the list of titles. It's a predella, which is a, in traditional um, European style triptychs of the Middle Ages that are typically religious in nature, almost all of them are, um, there's an extra bit of information that runs along the bottom that'll just add scenes that sort of reiterates what's going on above. That's called a predella. So I did a predella for this that was originally going to be attached and it folded up. It didn't work. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just make the predella come with it when you open it, and I'll recall, I'll retitle it to a portable predella. <laughs> so, and then the title of it is called Glutton's Lament, Memorial for a Fallen Tomato. Okay, the thing, it, there's a summary, this is sort of a summary image where I gave it a slogan, like, Make America Great Again, you know? Although these days I heard this, it's making attorneys get attorneys, <laughs> which I heard, which is, I'm like, yeah. Um, it says, we eat, we sleep, we hate, repeat. Okay? That's, don't need much explanation there. It's all about gorging yourself on hate. And so when it's shown, I'll keep it at the bottom here. But what it is, it it's a, it's a, it a mimics the explosion up high of all the hot dogs, hamburgers, tacos, chicken legs, ice cream that's exploding behind Lord Apocalyptus. Oh, and see Papa Apocalypto in the first scene, he isn't dead yet because Papa is short what they called the Pope. He's not dead yet. He becomes Lord after he dies. It's the same character. Okay? Well, this bottom panel... Um, I'll show you guys. It's two-sided as well. And so this is it. This is the front. And it's a typical, you know, baker 
woman character serving bacon and eggs, actually, that make a face. <laughs> the bacon and eggs actually make a face down there because it's all about going that extra mile. And then the backside are these giant tomato asteroids falling toward the Earth. Okay, now I encourage you all to come up and look at it close. But, so this image is the last thing that I did. I did not, it's very unusual for me, I did not have the backside figured out for this. I couldn't settle on what it was going to be. And so, I COVID, I moved my studio um, out into the country. And I have had a friend named Billy Booyer who I grew up with. And uh, he was a carpenter. And he, uh, he helped us renovate the studio. And right as soon as we were about to finish the studio, Billy committed suicide. He was, like, I grew up with him. He was like the fourth Hutt brother. And Billy killed himself um, in 2020. And he raised tomatoes. And... Um, He always was a really big fan of my work because he lived out in that part of the world and he was like, oh my God, I know that. I know that. I know what you're talking about there. He was always supportive, but he had a hard time, especially during COVID. He was a contractor and, and he, was, he couldn't find work. And there was some mental illness in there as well, but people where I'm from, they don't get help. It's a macho thing. People in the rural areas just don't get help. And it totally floored us all. And I started thinking, okay, this last panel, i got to do something. And the reason that I decided to do something about Billy is because he was a casualty of it in some way, not ever getting out of that small town, although he was not a MAGA-style Republican. He was ultra-freaking... He was almost a communist, like a real Che Guevara <laughs> leftist, you know. And so I decided, well, whenever I'm going to do something about Billy in this last part because I'm pissed at him. Because when people commit suicide, what they do is they write themselves out of history because it's too painful to talk about. And the Met had already agreed to get number one of this. And so I was like, I'm going to fucking do, I'm going to put Billy in it with his dates. And so it says, remember the Bill Bill and his dates in there with giant tomato asteroids hurling towards Earth because he raised tomatoes. I win, Billy. You're forever in our history. You're not forgotten. I win, you asshole, for doing what you did, you know? And so... <laughs> Whenever I told you about the Met writing about it, it blew me away that Nadine Ornstein, the, the, the print curator at the Met, wrote, she explained everything. And Memorial for a Fallen Tomato is about Tom Huck's friend, Billy Booyer, who committed suicide during it. I was like, oh my God, Billy, it's in the Met. You know, forever, it's there. And so I went. Well, there's one little thing. So I originally planned this to be a flap that folded up and down. And so if you look, I made the tomatoes work upside down, their faces as well, so it works upside down, a frown or a happy face. And there's also a reference in here to scud. There's scuds. I did a print with Mike Sims at Lawrence Lithography Workshop years ago. It's in the book. Um, and I brought the same character as back flying through space. So they're coming back. So anyway, I finished the whole project. During COVID, it was very difficult to finish it. And then I had to go, then we had to glue, figure out how to glue this whole thing together. I got really lucky that this um, preparator conservator from the St. Louis Art Museum her specialty is Japanese papers. She told me how to taught us how to glue these things together, although she had never glued anything this big. There were some disasters 
but we figured it out. It's extremely hard to do. These things are made to order, just like White Castle or McDonald's or whatever. And I have a few of them left, you know, and we're, there's, there's a lot of interest still from museums coming, and I'm going to show it twice, two more times this year. Um, but that's a Monkey Mountain Chronicle. Okay, there you go. I hope I explained it all in depth enough for everyone. Okay, I'll take questions and you can ask me anything you want. Yes, ma'am. I have a weird question. Uh, what do you think about this phenomenon of people responding to the Grimace Gate by making videos? I saw a Courtney Cox one. <laughs> okay. Like, what does that say? That's what I, what do you think? <laughs> It's, it's like a grimace to like well, Grim. I know they're trying. I know all. I don't know all the characters. There's the Hamburglar, Grimace. Those are really the only two I can remember. Mayor McCheese. That's right. I don't know. I saw a Courtney Cox one, and I've kind of dipped out of Instagram a little bit lately because I'm so burned out, and it's freaking me out. So I. I I approve of it because it gives me more shit to make art about down the road, you know? But it's part of, it's exactly what this is about. Yeah. It's like marketing something that you don't know why, but you kind of do it because everybody else is doing it, you know? There's my yeah, answer. Yeah, I just think it's funny that, like, there has been a lot of kind of art responding to this sort of gluttony. There's, like, a band called Max Sabbath. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I know about Max yeah, Sabbath. Uh, there's this guy called... Uh, I know of it. I know of it. I get a lot of like, have you seen? Have you seen this? And I'm like, oh my God, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting that the scrimmage thing allows like normal people to be like, okay, we're all doing it now. We're I know. All, like, the grotesque aspect of like grimacing. Mm -hmm. Grimace is fat! I mean, for all he's gonna kill us all. He's fat! <laughs> <laughs> all right, next. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Cherry. Cherry plywood. I used to carve on birch years ago because that's what my teachers told me to do when I was trying to work like this a long time ago. But the problem is the quality has gotten, has, it's so bad at places where you can get it, like at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. Even, so I moved up to marine birch. Uh, the print I did with Mike was on marine birch. And I, I just sort of eventually graduated Dewar used cherry, he used pear. I'm gonna use cherry because it holds up over a long printing, but it also doesn't splinter when I'm carving it. And I really try to minimize splintering, but I still want the look of the rough wood line. So yeah, I use I use cherry. More questions. Nothing? That's it? Am I really off the hook? It's up to you. Okay. It's up to the viewer. I do think, I think along, okay, where is the viewer's eye going to go when I'm drawing these things out? There is compositionally a lot of consideration given to where things are in all of my pieces because I like making great organized pictures like my heroes did and that really matters but at a certain point there ends up being so much going on you just got to make sure that there's a lot of interest in a, a, a lot of balance from left to right okay this is getting in the weeds but i i use a system a, a, a renaissance system of picture making where it's either a circle in a square or a pyramid in a circle, or a pyramid, a circle in a square, or a pyramid, a circle in a square with an X, or an X with a pyramid upside down in a circle in a square. <laughs> I, I studied all of those Renaissance painters and how they constructed their pictures from the time I was a kid. And I more often than not end up with pyramid and a circle and a square. If you look, corner to corner, 
There's a circle in here. From here, they make the circle-ish, and then it's in square. And now, I don't even plan that out anymore. I just do it naturally because it's, I typically end up in that realm where I, that's the way I draw moving the viewer's eye around. That's the thing that I used to tell my students. We're not doing this stuff in a vacuum, guys. You've got to study the way the old guys and gals did it. So, there. One more. Yeah. I didn't think of this until you mentioned the grimace. <laughs> Oh yeah. Where it's here we go. Something new. <sighs> Talk about what eating. So there's this whole genre of video and it's people eating. But not just eating, but just mass amounts of food. I, so here one so you know, a video. So it's a person and there's like maybe enough food for like ten people mm -hmm. and they just sit there and shove food in their face and that's the video. I want and, 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 and it's I wanted, I was hoping for the lightning to strike the hot dog eating contest a couple days ago. Like, well, somebody's just stuffing themselves, you know, when people are starving here. Yeah. It's actually, wait, America. I'm only about this now. Uh, so I was a medieval college, and I read this book called Holy Feast and Holy Fast, which is about like medieval people and obsession with food. Man, I need to see, find like, that book. Oh, it's like Carolyn Walker Bynum. She's a professor at Princeton. It's a great book. Uh, but yeah, like, so these nuns would be starving themselves and, like, eating their, like, pus and shit and thinking Ugh. it was, like, from Jesus. Like, that was... Oh, place. yeah. Like, they would, like, it got really, like, bizarre. And they'd be, like, rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, the mukbang thing is actually fascinating because it's, like, the American version of that. Because a lot of them are, like, these girls that are in these cute little dresses mm -hmm. and they're, like, skinny. And they're able to eat all this food and it's, like, a fetish. Like, mm -hmm. when the fat guys do it, it's not hitting the same button. <laughs> <laughs> One last thing, and then we'll stop, but I'll bring it. It just got me there. Yeah. I'm a big Bosch fan. I love Hieronymus Bosch. And for years, uh, nobody can figure out what in the world that was about. Alchemy, yeah, probably. But I was told by a guy named Steve Goddard, who was the print curator at the Spencer Museum. He was an early big supporter of mine. He was like, that stuff's about ergotism. I was like, what's ergotism? And it's all about like rye bread back then was rotten. The seeds were rotten. And when they cooked it, when it baked, it turns into LSD. And people were eating it and getting really sick and having all these crazy hallucinations. Well, there was an order of monks called St. Anthony, it was St. Anthony's order. You know, St. Anthony was tempted by all, and they treated it, and it was called St. Anthony's fire, was the condition. And they were, and they believed that a lot of Bosch's stuff and Bruegel and a lot of that crazy imagery came from notations of people's hallucinations that they were having while being sick with ergotism. And it turns out that they think that's what the Salem witch trials were. It was, they were hallucinating, and people don't know how to deal with it. Oh, burn her! She's a witch! You know, like Monty Python, of course. But that sort of, and that's just fascinating to me. So I'm never going to really get over it, you know. All right, that's it. Thanks, guys. If anybody wants a book, I'll sign them for them. And thank you for coming. Sherry told me I better put some art history in there, so I did.